yesterday's sermon, I felt impressed to tell you the story about my student who came to cause trouble. Because I thought that a story about restoration of somebody who was really a rebel. I didn't plan on sharing, so it took some time to finish it. Then I couldn't finish the sermon. I decided not to mention the third C. You know, we have three C's for the Elijah message of restoration. And, um, and just go directly to the conclusion about the atheistic French pilot. I want to conclude with that. And I thought you as my students would just let it go. You know, forget there was three C's. But no, being A students, you kept telling me all day yesterday, what about the third C? What's the third C? What's the third C? So then I decided to preach about the third C. So you have all of them now. Thank you for being so attentive. Now let me give you a little quiz. What are the first three, the first two C's of the characteristics of the Elijah message? Context, background. What's the context? It's relevant. It relates to our day. Okay? It's about the day of the Lord. It's about the second coming of Jesus. That's very relevant. That's the context. It is an Advent message. It relates to us as seven-day Adventists. And what kind of a day of Lord will it be? Good and bad. Good for those good, or it says great, of course great, to those who have decided to be broken on the rock, Jesus. It takes a lot of humility to allow yourself to be broken under the power of the Lord. But the other group who will have a terrible day will be those who resisted to be restored to Jesus and continue to rebel against the pleas of Jesus. So finally, the rock has to fall on them. We don't want to be a part of a group. There's no reason why we should wait recklessly until the time of judgment. We need to be saved now so we won't be condemned later. What's the second characteristic? The content. And we talk about the content being having to do with family relations. He restore the fathers to their children and the children to their fathers. Somebody asked me, does this only mean fathers? No, no, it means families. Fathers, mothers, children, sons, daughters. Family restoration, and we gave the reason for that. It's because the family affects everything. It does affect everything. Think about it. It affects our church atmosphere Sabbath morning. You know what happens Sabbath morning many times? People start to argue. And they try to finish the argument in the house. And it doesn't end. So they, say they continue in the car. We should finish that in the car. After all, it will take us 20 minutes to get to the church. And then they come to the parking lot. It's still arguing. But you know, it's not acceptable to be arguing coming to the foyer of the church. 
So then they decide to suppress it inside to be continued later. But that provides a certain atmosphere in the church, doesn't it? You can smile. You can say hi to people. But if that's what you're full of, this angst, it will show. Like Ellen White said, each one of us exerts an atmosphere for good or for evil by which we impact people. Hmm. And we talked about, you know, how we need to teach values. Old-fashioned virtues, honesty, integrity, goodness, courtesy, respect, Uh, by the way, I, uh, during COVID, I was scheduled to preach for four years at camp meetings, workers' meetings. And when I retired, I thought, wow, I have a hobby. Four years of preaching and teaching all over. Soon as I retired, COVID hit. And my ministry was shut down, most of it. I said, now what, what, what do I do now? I live on a golf course, but I don't play golf. All I do is walk on the golf course for exercise, and my hobby is to collect golf balls. Elitist, oh, the most expensive ones. And like I have a thousand of them, maybe more. And my wife encourages me, please get rid of them. Get rid of them. I don't want to see so many balls in my garage. So please, I'm making this public announcement. If you need golf balls, see me afterwards. I'll only charge you for the postage. It's free. Thank you. And then also, But the Lord reminded me, he gave me another hobby I could occupy my time with. I use my phone a lot to talk to people, to minister to people, to pray for people during that crisis. And he said, you know, you can write. That's true. I could write, I would have blocks of time uninterrupted. And the Lord blessed me with writing seven books during two years of COVID. One of them, they're being edited and proofread. One of them is already out there entitled Christ's Way of Healing. Why I wrote that book? Because a lot of people were stressed out, emotionally distraught. But how does Jesus, the great physician, bring emotional healing? Social healing, mental healing, spiritual healing. And how the great physician, Jesus, unique Jesus, monogenous Jesus, brought about healing and restoration and the exact perfect vaccine. He shed blood to rid us of the deadly virus of sin. The third one, I'm just reviewing with you for the ones who are not here and to connect you with the, uh, with the uh, sermon. The third one is characteristics. What are the characteristics of this Elijah message of restoration? One, the first characteristic is found in John Chapter 1 and verse 9. If you could open your Bible to that. John, I don't have it on the screen. I appreciate people who have it on the screen, but I'm doing this purposely because I want us to open our Bibles. To me, there's a special blessing in touching real paper and seeing where you underline the words of God. By the way, it's a good idea to keep 
your hard copy Bible. Don't always depend on the cell phone. Because during the time of trouble, the problem will not be electricity. What would you do if our electric grid gets attacked? Now, you got to have this. You know what? Because this doesn't need electricity. It's good to have it around. And I don't know, I use my cell phone for these things, but when I see my own old Bible, see how old it is? Took with me to Africa. I faced many dangerous situations. This Bible was my stay. It kept me going. So it's my friend, I don't want to let go of it. So cherish your Bibles. And I said, John 1, 29. This is the first characteristic. And it's talking about our focus in the last days on the Savior, but not self. There's a difference. There is too much focus on self in this world. It's about time we focus on the Savior. Self doesn't offer real help, but the Savior offers real help. And if you have your Bible open to that, would you please read it? Stand up and read it and raise your voice. Okay, what's the reference? John 1.29. I want you to participate this morning. Please, I see your Bible right there in front. Can you read it for us, please? You receive a blessing by reading the Word of God publicly. And that's what John the Baptist. We've been talking about Elijah and John the Baptist. And Jesus said, John the Baptist is the Elijah to come. And when he saw Jesus, he forgot about himself being such a great prophet. Have you ever met uh, spiritual leaders who think they are somebody? Have you? You look at them and you feel like, like you're in the White House or somewhere. I worked at the General Conference. I was just seeing the editor of the Adult Sabbath School lesson quarterly. And it's just being busy and having a high position and reaching your goal. And some of my old friends, would walk by me and not even say hi because they are too busy doing important work for God. So one time I felt tempted to follow one of them, kind of follow him and say, excuse me to interrupt you walking, but you, you, you know, I'm Philip Saman, your friend. Yeah, I know, I know. But like, we don't talk anymore. Oh, well, I'm too busy doing God's work. May your position, no matter how high or low, may it never affect how you relate to people. Jesus had a very high position, the Savior of the world and the Lord of Lords. Yet, we talk to people, lowly people, regular people, but John the Baptist being such a great prophet, no man born of woman was greater than John the Baptist, Jesus said, because he's the only one who was related to Jesus. Six months apart in age plus, he ushered in the first coming of Jesus. What a great honor. When he saw Jesus, he said, behold. What does it mean to behold? It doesn't say, look, glance. Behold the Lamb of God. Meaning, gaze into his face. Become acquainted with his personality. Absorb his heavenly influence. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's our mission to point people to the Savior and not to self. 
I met an evangelist some years ago. He said, I am, I would say, one of the most successful evangelists. My methods work. I baptize a lot of people. And if people follow my example, God's work would be finished on this earth. And I listen patiently, kindly. I knew he had a good heart. But I like to, you know, react to what people say. I said, that's wonderful that you're such a successful person, that you use such wonderful methods. But where does Jesus, what does he play a part in all of that? Oh, he's a nice person. I love him. I believe in him. But this thing I have to produce myself by sweat and hard work. My friends, we're nothing without Jesus. We should always point people to behold the Lamb of God. Don't, don't behold self. Behold Philip Saman. Shame on me if I ever feel tempted to do that. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Oh, by the way, Satan abuses and misapplies scripture. He knows the scripture well. He uses the scripture, but in the wrong way. And this is how he uses it in the wrong way. First of all, behold the Lamb of God. He agrees with that. And he said, afterwards, get rid of your sins. And that becomes legalism. Because nobody has the power to get rid of our sins. Impossible. That's why Jesus came to this world to die for us. And so, you see, Satan says, okay, I believe in this verse. So behold the Lamb of God, that's good enough for me. And then, get rid of your sins. Does it say that? No. Come on, let's read it again. Behold the Lamb of God, which or who? Who refers to the antecedent, the Lamb of God? Behold the Lamb of God, who? That's the Lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world. We do the beholding. And he does the taking away of our sins. Is that logical? The other trick Satan has is he reverses the order. See, God is a God of order. Satan is the God of disorder. And how does he reverse the order? Oh, he, now keep the whole verse. It's okay. It's a good verse, he says. But the first thing you do is get rid of your sins. After you finish with that, awesome task than try to behold the Lamb of God. People do that, by the way. I'm not worthy to come to the Lamb of God. I'm not good enough. I have to improve myself to be accepted by the Lamb of God. So what do I do? I try hard to get rid of my sins. So when I come to Jesus, I'm really looking nice. I know of a good friend, whenever he is due for a physical at his doctor's office, all of a sudden, after one year, he begins to, I mean, the last week before he has a physical, he begins to lift weights, eat good, no sweets. And I said, why are you doing that? He said, so I could impress my physician. Excuse me? Are we trying to impress our great physician? Does he know us through and through? Isn't he called the great physician and aren't we his patients? We go to the doctor not to impress him, but he can help us with our sickness. I asked somebody one time who was really working hard and getting rid of his sins. I said, how long have you been working at it? 
Oh, he said, the past seven years. H how, how has it been working for you, getting rid of you? He said, oh, it's not working at all. It's very discouraging. So if I give you another seven years, would things improve? He said, I don't think so. <laughs> And then like Dr. Phil, I don't know if you watch Dr. Phil on television, he counsels people who need help, real help. And he asks the interesting question, well, sir, if you've been trying to solve your problem for the past so many years, has it been working for you so far? That's the question he asks. No, sir, that's why I'm here. So it hasn't worked for you for 10 years, no. So, sir, what were you thinking? Come on, what were you thinking? And Jesus, as our great physician and counselor, would come to us and say, has it been working for you getting rid of your sin? No, sir. What were you thinking? Were you thinking you were going to conquer your sins by yourself? I'm glad you finally came to me because that promise in John 1, 29 says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes care, who gets rid of the sins of the world. The right order, first thing we do, we behold. Second thing that happens, Jesus gets rid of our sins, not against our will, but in cooperation with us. Why would we want to hang on to cancer? Why do we want to hang on to sickness? You are in the embrace of the great physician. Let him take care of you. And then, and then, in John 3.30, so I want somebody to look it up. John 3 and verse 30. And, uh, I don't know your name, brother, but you at the corner here. I've seen you in my seminar yesterday. Can you read that for us? I repeat, John 3, 30. Don't you think there's a blessing of reading God, God's word publicly? I believe there is a blessing. Yes, sir. John 3, verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. Okay, if you can stand up and look at the folks. He, he must what? John the Baptist said this to Jesus. <laughs> he must increase, but I must decrease. Isn't that the perfect order? Some people reverse that. Somehow our sinful human nature propels us to reverse this. Let me work hard at humbling myself. Let me work hard at decreasing self. But we don't, we can't decrease self without the help of Jesus. So the first task, first and foremost task, is to invite Jesus to come into our hearts and increase, and increase, and increase. And thus, he can squeeze self out. You don't have the power to squeeze yourself out. Self is a terrible taskmaster. Lord, help us to have you so increase in our lives that that squeezes self out. You know, to make this point clear, a story is told of a little boy
who loved Jesus with all his heart, was like four years old. He prayed to Jesus. He enjoyed going to Sabbath school. He sang songs about Jesus. But one thing puzzled him about his prayer. You know, children at that age take things literally. They cannot think in the abstract. So he took this literally. He asked his dad, Daddy, I prayed to Jesus this morning and every morning, and something is puzzling me. I asked Jesus to come and live in my life. But what's puzzling me, Daddy, is that Jesus is so big, and I'm so small. So how can the big Jesus fit in my body? Is that, I never thought of it that way. I mean, isn't Jesus big? Oh, yeah, he's a big person compared to you. But, Daddy, how can he fit in my small body? His father didn't have the answer, but the child had the answer. He said, Daddy, it must be. So I invite him to come into my heart, and he comes. But he's so big, I'm so small, he must always be sticking out of me. That's wonderful theology, especially about witnessing. You don't stick out. The Lord Jesus sticks out through you. You don't get the glory. Jesus gets the glory. This afternoon in one of my seminars, I think at four, I'm talking about Christ's method of reaching people. We're going to talk about socialize, sympathize, save, and serve. We're going to talk about how Jesus becomes our witnessing partner, our prayer partner. Prayer. How does Jesus pray for us and the people we witness to? He prays personally, passionately, powerfully, and perpetually. if you allow Jesus to reveal himself through you, then your life ceases to be boring. There should be no boredom in the Christian experience. It must always be an exciting spiritual adventure. Christ has something up his sleeve to pleasantly surprise you, and you call this serendipity. A pleasant and expected surprise. Don't you want your life to be an exciting spiritual adventure? Because God has a lot of people he needs to save. People all around us are wistfully looking for something this world cannot give. He wants to use you. My friends, let me ask you, in a spiritual way. What is really sticking out of you and me? I'll ask the question again. What's really sticking out of you and me? And when people interact with us, what bubbles out of us? Is it self or is it the Savior? It should never be self because there is too much of self and self has no answers. What bubbles out of us must always be the Savior. We'll be talking about this in my seminar this afternoon. Hmm. Another thing about characteristics found in Matthew 3, 12. John went about witnessing for Jesus. And he said, repent. Oh, one of the characteristics has to do with repentance. That's an old-fashioned word. I mean, 
Do we really ask people to repent? Jesus loves you. He cares about you so that he wants you to repent. I don't hear many sermons about repentance. But as an integral characteristic of the final remnant, preaching the message of John the Baptist. Repent. Why? It's urgent. It's not something we just take for granted, we procrastinate like it's something not urgent. No, no. Repent. Why? Because the kingdom of God is at hand. Is the kingdom of God at hand? Do you believe the kingdom of God is at hand, the second come of Jesus is at hand? I believe that. I tell you, COVID also, the pandemic, increased my faith in that because no other pandemic covered the world. Every corner of the world, every island, it was universal, it was global. And I really believe it was a wake-up call. A wake-up call. Why? Because we'll have another pandemic, universal. We'll have another global flood. As there was a flood of fire, I mean, as there were a flood of water, in Noah's time, there'll be a flood of fire. No, some people don't believe that. Even I met some Adventists who don't believe in that. Oh, uh, uh, God doesn't really punish people. He is too loving to punish people. Well, do you remember the flood? It wasn't forever, it was quick. Oh yeah, but you know, I question the universal flood. I don't think it covered the whole world. It was local floods. Oh my friends, why do we doubt the global flood? I don't want to discuss the science of it, but anywhere I traveled in the world, valleys, mountainous areas, there's always a line. Strata, fish, fossils on top of high mountains. There was a universal flood, and that's why every creature outside the ark perished. And the apostle Peter says, today there are cynics who don't believe in that. But he said, there'll be a flood of fire. The very elements will melt. I'm not trying to scare you. It's just a fact. Global COVID-19, I believe, is to prepare us to face the final global pandemic. Fiery flood. Please, I shouldn't leave you with that note. I don't want to be scared. You don't have to be scared of the flood. The three Hebrew friends were not afraid of the fire furnace. Why? Because Jesus was walking with them. And they overcame the fire because Jesus is a consuming fire and he fought fire with fire and he won. Jesus always wins and you win if you stay close to him. A story is told. I hope you don't mind if I tell stories and illustrations. Is that okay? okay it, it, it keeps us awake. It makes it more practical. A story is told of a prairie hen with her chicks. And there was a great prairie fire whipping through the dry glass, a grass. And the hen was trying to stay close to the chicks as she led them forward, except she realized quickly the fire was faster. So she stopped. 
She opened her wings and the chicks came under the wings. And the fire came and went over the hen. And the farmer later on observed that the chicks came from under her wings. Were chirping, walking around, but the mother was scorched to death. If an animal like a chicken had the maternal instinct to give her life for her chicks, how much more Jesus have the eternal divine instinct to allow himself to be scorched on the cross to save you and me. But you know something? We can learn from the little chicks. Do you like little chicks? I like little animals. It's so cute. Little tiny things. They sometimes seem to be more intelligent and obedient than us. Let's learn from the chicks. They did not oppose the mother. They obeyed the mother and hid under her wings and Jesus gained the same appeal. It's interesting how Jesus describes himself. He didn't say he was an eagle. He said he was a hen. I'm a man. I never want anybody to call me a hen. And to demean a man, we say he's just a chicken. That's all he is. Jesus did not mind comparing himself to a hen. And what did he say when he prayed for Jerusalem? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, my people of Israel, my people at this camp meeting, how many times I tried to gather you as a hen. gather you under my wings, but you wouldn't let me. You would not let me. Don't ever say, God, where are you? How come you've forsaken me? No, it's not right. Because he is the one who has every right to say, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Because indeed the father forsook him on the cross, that you and I may never be forsaken. And he said that in Aramaic, we've been learning about the three languages that Jesus spoke in my seminars. Aramaic, Eli, Eli, Lama Shabaktani. And he spoke Aramaic when he was really intense and passionate about something. He's intense and passionate about you. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he say? My soul is pressed unto death. Trust. Great emotion. My Jesus, you Jesus, can show emotion. Can shed tears. Can say, my heart recoils within me. My heart churns through and through because I love you and I want to save you. The word Gethsemane is Aramaic. That means oil press, where they press the olives to produce olive oil. And I'm talking from experience, because I use on our farm in Syria, we would harvest the olives and then put them in sacks and put them on the back of mules and donkeys and take them up to the village where well, we have an oil press that belongs to the whole village, and we would empty all these olives 
in this big cauldron, metal cauldron, big, and two stone heavy wheels mounted and pulled round around by horses. Hundreds, many times, till the olives became very soft paste. And Jesus appropriately said, my soul is pressed unto death, and the olives were pressed unto death. And I remember after the olives became paste, take shovels and put it in round containers made out of canvas, like pita bread, you know, with a hole in the middle? You fill it, and then they're stacked high up there, and the comp hydraulic compactors would come and squeeze, squeeze these containers tighter and tighter, and the precious olive oil would ooze out. Precious olive oil would ooze out to give life to Middle Eastern people who love olive oil. That's their life. And the same thing happened. Jesus' soul was squeezed and to death. On the cross, the precious life-giving blood who's out to give you and me salvation. Isn't that a wonderful thing? What could Jesus have done even more than to help us? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's urgent. It's relevant for today. Well, you know, I make appeals when I preach. When I was younger, I didn't make appeals because, you know, I was green, I was immature, and I wanted to protect people's feelings, not to put them on the spot. But we can put people on the spot if we speak the truth in love and tears in our voice. I put this troublemaker in my class on the spot, but in love. And he told me after, he said, you know, Dr. Saman, even though I just felt I want to cooperate with you, because I really felt in my soul, you cared about me, you loved me. But you know, we have the extreme, don't we? Alan White said, always speak the truth in love with tears in your voice. But Satan uses that beautiful standard and he takes it to extremes. Everything that's good, the devil takes it to extremes. How the, what are the two extremes? On one hand, tell the truth without love. And the other extreme, love without telling the truth. Do you resonate with me? Like a medical doctor told this young mother in my class, 28 years old, trying to get her education. Two small children. She had lump on her breast. She got tested and was worried to death. Her doctor called her and said, I'm here to give you the results. You only have three months to live. It was so shocking to this young mother, she fainted. They had to bring oxygen to revive her. I knew this doctor, and we had discussion about that. He said, well, you know, I'm known to be frank. I'm known to tell it like it is. I said, doctor, but there are different ways to tell the truth. You don't have to shock her to make her faint, to need oxygen. You could say, you know, we discovered something. 
But with the advanced medical science, we're going to do our best to help you. Be positive. Don't kill the lady before she dies. Come on now. Let's have some common sense. But these days, common sense is not common anymore. Did you realize that? Well, when I get invited to speak at different parts of the world, I won't be specific. I just do this to caution us. Dr. Saban, we heard you were an interesting speaker, good insights, and we heard that you give appeals for people to repent. Yes, but with kindness and love. Try to follow the example of Jesus. Well, I just want to tell you, our people here are not used to that. They're a little bit touchy about an appeal. It makes them feel uncomfortable. They like to relax and have a sermon to make them feel good. Yes? To be comfortable. So please, you know, no appeals. Just be interesting, but no appeals to repent. I said, you know, I often give analogies to drive the point home. I said, the latest I know is that Satan gives many appeals for people to follow him. Isn't that true? Enticing appeals incessantly every minute, every hour of the day. It's high time we get appeals for people to follow Jesus, not Satan. Either I make appeals, I'm not coming. Oh yeah, but we have nice fringe benefits, nice hotels, nice accommodation. No, no, I got to make an appeal for Jesus. So, one conference friend agreed with me, I would talk about that. That was a special series on repentance. Oh, you can do it, but you know, be, be easy on the people. You know, be easy. I mean, be gentle. I, will, I promise I'll be very gentle. I'll go out of my way to be gentle. I made an appeal. People were weeping the way I presented Jesus. If you, if you feel you have something that's bothering you, something on your heart, if you like Judas, and you have something ashamed of, and the head of Jesus touches your feet. By that, he's saying, I'm eager to help you, to use my best to help you at your worst. You don't want to hold on to that till Jesus comes too late. The door of the ark is still open. It's never too late. You know something? Hundreds of people came forward to seek repentance. Apparently, people today need to repent. I asked my students, 90 of them, in Adventist heritage at Southern, if Christ were to come tomorrow based on the relationship with Jesus. Would you be ready to go? Excuse me, two or three raise their hands. The majority don't. Shouldn't our Christian education, shouldn't our worship services instill in our people's minds, young and old? And based on the word of God, based on the spirit of prophecy, we can have the assurance of salvation. If you have some sins to repent of, please do it as soon as possible before it's too late. So a line of people, hundreds of people, came forward to repent. I won't tell you the whole story, but you know, I, I was awake till midnight talking to people. People were eager to repent and be relieved of their guilt and be restored. 
was a young man, a teenager, came to repent for his dad. He said, you know, I need to repent, but especially for my dad, he is not here. And he's an elder in the church. Seemed very godly. But then he got infatuated with the sec young secretary at the office. He was living a double life. He needs help. If Jesus comes today, he won't be saved. I came to appeal to you to pray for my dad. We knelt together and we prayed. Lord God, my faith is not strong enough. I anchor my weak faith in Jesus' mighty faith. Lord, my prayer is fickle. I anchor my fickle prayer in Jesus' formidable prayer. And right now, I pray for this father who's blinded, leaving a good wife, a good church. The devil is attacking him to discourage many other people. Please, Lord, save him before it's too late. I beg of you, save him. As I was praying, these words come to my head. I didn't expect right now Lord, I imagine he is with this young lady. Embracing? I don't know what they might be doing. But whatever the situation is, cause this young lady to lose total interest in him. May she pull away from him to surprise him. And after that, go to the room. He brought a a suitcase with all his trinkets, with all his shaving cream, whatever a man carries. Now, put all that junk in his suitcase, zip it up. And I know she is petite and he's a big guy, but give her strength beyond herself. And cause her to carry the suitcase, open the door and throw it on the steps. After she finished the suitcase, come to him. Get hold of him, push him and push him. Open the ender's door and throw him out. And may he fall and even bruise his knees to hurt a little bit and to open his eyes from being blind. In Jesus' name, amen. The next day, the young man came and he said, God chose to answer our prayer in behalf of my dad. He already, exactly what you prayed for happened. It shamed him, it humiliated him. And he, he called the pastor to help them reconcile. People need to repent before it's too late. Finally, I told my wife to strum the harp because I'm going to make an appeal. In Revelation, Jesus speaks to our hearts and says, Here I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, there's a condition. All God's promises are conditional. If anyone, we have a choice. He doesn't force it on us. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in to be with him and he with me, to have supper together. He loves us intensely. And his love seeks togetherness always. If you love someone, you want to be with them. You know, uh, when I share this promise, 
I think when we were both attending Andrews University many years ago, and we had some friends in the different apartments. And let's say John was my good friend and his wife. And Saturday evening we knock at the door of the apartment and nobody answers. Knock again, nobody answers. And my wife being a Western woman, she said, let's go home. Well, you're ready to go home, I'm not. Why not? I said, I need to speak to them. I believe if they heard my voice, they would open the door. It's an urgent call. She said, no, you're bothering people. He said, I don't care. I want to talk to them. Maybe that's extreme. And then, as I knock, I say, this is Philip, your friend, Lily. And we're coming to see you. And when they heard our name, they opened the door, and we had a good time together. Jesus not only knocks, he talks, because he's deeply interested in us opening the door to him. And he's been waiting for a long time. Just like the days of Noah. 120 years, the door of the rock was open. As a child, I saw a movie about the flood. It made an indelible impression on my mind till this day. Because, because everybody drowned. There was nothing but an ocean. But the strongest worker of Noah, according to Hollywood, was his uncle. And he was the only one floating. But no tree, no mountain, no hill to hang on to. And he came to the door of the ark. After 120 years of working for Noah, and he said, uh, Noah, I'm your uncle, please open, I don't want to die. He said, I wish I could. But the angel closed it already. The time will come when God will close the door. But come on, I'm your uncle, you can't let me die. Please open the door. I've been nice to you, I just didn't believe in what you're saying, but I'm your uncle. I cannot, I wish I could. And the camera focused on the hands of this uncle, beating on the door, beating on the door, desperately, till his hands became bloody. And gradually, they faded beneath the ocean. And red water was all over the place. I vowed to God as a child, by your grace, Lord, I will never be found in that situation, a regretful situation. I want to be ready to go inside the ark. I want you to be ready to go inside the ark. So as my wife continues playing the harp, I want us all to bow our heads. I mean, the Savior is waiting, has been waiting to enter your heart and my heart. What forbids us from letting him in? We let many people into our houses. We let many things enter our heart. Why not let Jesus? The door of the ark is still open. Why not take advantage of that and enter? When? Now. Urgent, specific, precise. My friends, as you already know, most of you, Dr. Pastor B. Holmes, my dear friend that I taught with at the seminary, bless his heart, giving a seminar at the age of 94. He went to meet Jesus while he was ministering to people. 
peacefully last night. He passed away. When I saw him a couple of days ago, I rushed to him to say hi, to talk to him about salvation and Jesus and ministry. And he loved it. I couldn't believe it this morning when I heard the news. My friend's life is not certain. You don't have to be old. It could happen to anybody. Why not be safe in the ark? Why not be safe under the wings of Jesus? Why not be safe? Opening the door for your heart where Jesus can fellowship with you. So you never have to have any regrets. If you have that conviction and you mean it, would you please raise your hand to heaven? Nobody is looking at you except God is between you and God. Dear Lord, bless the sacred commitment and resolution. May it be genuine and authentic. Oh dear Lord, take this commitment, this prayer close to your heart and may it upon your divine sovereign arm that can do the impossible as the Son of Man. Take it to the throne of your Father and grasp it. And may this result in the salvation of many at the hearing of my voice and prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.